which is more important, your own IQ or your nation's IQ? And why, for the sake of God, high IQ people tend to be more patient and save more money. Hi, and welcome to my show, The World of Roy Yosevich. In this show, I host and interview very interesting people from all around the world. If you'd like to support this channel, please do it on patreon.com. And if you want more, you can just book me for your next conference. And today, I'm honored and privileged to have Professor Garrett Jones. Now, Gary Jones is an associate professor of economics at the Center of Study of uh, Center at the Center for Study of Public Choice, John May Mason University. He is the author of Hive Mind. Where is Hive Mind, Garrett? Hive Mind. Um, it, yeah, my, my book Hive oh. Mind is published by Stanford University Press. Um, <laughs> Very glad to be here and talk about it today. And how your nation's IQ matters so much more than your own. By the way, his book is heavily quoted in my book, Intelligence, The Unpleasant Truth. And most recently, he published another very disturbing book just by the title, 10% Less Democracy, Why You Should Trust Elite a Little More and the Masses a Little Less. Ooh, wow. It looks like I'm talking with a fascist. So we will <laughs> start it off. <laughs> now, which is first glance looks like a contradiction to the first one. Hi, Garrett. How are you? How do you feel? Thank you so much for coming to the show. Glad to be here. It's great to talk about the merits of a moderate level of democracy and the merits of uh, trying to find ways to make your nation just a little bit smarter. Okay, so let's start. Thank you so much again. Now, uh, in one of your uh, uh, previous interviews, you said, I don't want to talk about where IQ comes from, but rather where your nation's IQ can take you. And you are a professor of economics. You, you're not a psychologist, yes? No, no, I, exactly. I'm an economist. Um, there's been a lot of research over the decades about why IQ differs across countries and across time and across family members. And I don't have anything new to add to that debate. Um, but what I can say something interesting about is where your nation's IQ takes you. I'm a macroeconomist. So I'm interested in spillovers, like how much your neighbors shape your productivity, how your neighbor's behavior shapes your ability to earn money. Um, so that's what I really what I wanted to focus on. And I wrote an entire book about that. Okay, so with your permission, I would like to start again. I know we will talk about your nation's IQ, but I would like to start with another with IQ, where IQ, where IQ come, comes from, but in a very, from a very different angle. Now, I wrote a book about the unpleasant truth or misconceptions regarding intelligence. And in Israel, I think that the biggest one is the idea of multiple different orthogonal intelligence, uh, a Howard Gardner theory, that you can be good mm -hmm. at one domain and be weak in another domain. Now, in your book, you start the book by saying something about the Da Vinci effect, which is a complete opposite of the entire multiple intelligences. So if you can please elaborate on what is the Da Vinci effect? The Da Vinci effect is the idea that when people are great in one area, they're probably above average in other areas as well. Just like Leonardo da Vinci was an expert at, um, at architecture, he was an expert at art, he was an expert at science. These skills went together. So it's the idea that skills in one area predict skills in another area. And this is the most robust finding in intelligence research is that people who are above area and say above average and say math skills tend to be above average in verbal skills as well. And uh, it's this is so true that every few years when I when I meet when I meet a psychologist, I, somebody who does IQ research, I ask the person, hey, um, common sense says that if you're strong in one area, you're weak in another. If somebody could do a study that proved that on average, people who are great at math are weak at verbal, or people who are great at reading other people's uh, emotions are, tend to be bad at science. What would happen to that person if somebody could publish a study that proved that? It's proved that pluses in one area predicted minuses in another area. They always tell me the same thing. If Nobody. somebody could really publish that, they would instantly become a famous psychologist because it would totally rock psychological research to its foundations. It is a very strong result that strength in one area predicts strength in another area. And that's exactly the opposite of what a lot of us want to believe. But the problem is our job is to believe the truth, not what we want to believe. 
I think that robust is like the magic word. IQ research gives us the most robust data in psychology. There is nothing more robust than IQ research for the last 120 years. I think that's a safe statement, especially about the tests themselves. Like where the tests come from, um, where the, why some people have higher scores than others, totally, ton of debate. But what the actual skills, the pattern of skills, that like predicts like, that skills predict skills, that is astonishingly robust. And I think it should be part of just the common knowledge of well-educated people around the world. Okay. Thank you so much. And I, I myself do feel exactly the same thing. When I, uh, when I lecture about IQ in Israel, I think that it's almost unfair that a short 45 minutes Raven test can predict so much regarding your life, your job. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. come? Why do you think this is possible that a 45 minutes Stupid Raven test. This is has nothing to do with reality. This is has nothing to do with concrete things. Why does this uh, forecast or predict so much? I think it's because so the Raven's test, which is kind of a visual pattern finding test. What's so I think part of the reason it captures something. What it captures is something that's it's the equivalent of like a test of your computer's chip speed. Um, you know, some of us have powerful computers. Some of us have weak computers. And you can run great software on any kind of computer, but it's just not going to run very well if your chip speed is really slow. And um, the Raven's test is like a few other um, pretty good IQ tests. They're sort of like the equivalent of testing the chip speed of your computer. And, you know, brain speed, brain power is w one really important ingredient. It's great to have super software for your computer, but it's crucial to have important hardware for your computer. And IQ is something like the important hardware. Um, people with low IQs can accomplish a lot. Um, actually, a lot of my book, the early part of my book in particular, is pointing out that for the individual wage earner, for the individual worker, your IQ doesn't predict your individual wages all that much. It does a much better job predicting your education. But um, nonetheless, if you're trying to predict how well a worker is going to do at his or her job, um, it, you can't come up with a better predictor than IQ. Okay, so I, I think that this is very important. And you speak about, you know, very uh, about the hardware, not the software. Jensen, in his uh, late in his later life, uh, wrote the book about timing the mind or synchronizing mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. mind. ECT, yeah. elementary cognitive task. And you see, even with the work of Professor Richard Heyer, that high IQ people tend to be much more efficient, much more fast. Uh, with, with just the how the thing, how fast the neurons are transmitted inside the brain. So I think yeah. that this is very, very true. Yes, these, these brain scan measures that are actually watching people make decisions um, does really back up the idea that an important part of a high IQ is something close to brain speed, something close to brain efficiency. And um, that those measures aren't everything yet, but they've made a really important contribution. And I think they really debunk the idea that IQ is just a measure of whether you were raised in a family that where you were trained on standardized tests as a kid. There's something deeper and more substantive there. Okay, so I, I'm going to ask you the last question re regarding where IQ come from, because comes mm -hmm. from, I'm sorry, because you have you had this amazing insight uh, in your interview with Stefan Molinox, and you said that usually we speak about the genetic environmental debate or the Flynn Jensen debate. And yeah, you yeah. said that A, Flynn couldn't find research to prove that IQ is purely environmental. And B, that Gene, uh, 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 James Flynn, as the biggest advocator for the envir environmental factor of intelligence, if we might want to say that intelligence is more genetics because we, we might be able to solve genetics, genetic problems more easily than cultural problems. Could, could you please say a few words on, on this very important subject? 
Sure, sure. Yeah, I should point out, like, when I did that interview years ago, um, the person who interviewed me had also been interviewing Flynn Turkheimer. And that's why I signed up for the interview. I looked online to see, like, who he was talking to major figures, major, very mainstream figures. Flynn has a great policy of speaking to just about everyone about it, his research, whether he agrees with them or not. That's the approach I tend to take. Um, and so I... I do think that we should be concerned if it turns out that uh, IQ differences are heavily shaped by culture, the way that Flynn argues, and I'm a huge Flynn fan. Everybody should read more of Flynn. It may turn out to be much harder to overcome um, cultural differences. It may be much harder to overcome um, differences in the way a society thinks compared to being able to overcome genetic problems. So for instance, think about me and my glasses here. I'm wearing these glasses. My vision isn't that good. Almost surely a lot of that is genetic. Maybe most of that is genetic. But that genetic problem, as many people have pointed out, can be fixed very easily with just a little bit of technology. Total genetic problem, easy fix with technology. So genetic causes of IQ differences, to the extent they turn out to be important, that may be good news for the ability to close IQ gaps. It may turn out that some future world will find the equivalent of eyeglasses um, for closing IQ gaps. Um, I'm not the first person to make this point, um, but the mere fact that a, that a difference is caused by genetics does not mean that it is intractable or unfixable or permanent. We fix many genetic problems in the modern world, and we should hope to be able to fix even more. So I just want to let my viewers know that if they want to uh, uh, more data about this subject, how you can just fix what is the equivalent of glasses to intelligence, there is a lovely book called G is for Genes and how we need to incorporate the intelligence data into our educational system. So I think this is exactly where you are where heading. So now let's go to your book, okay? And... Uh, IQ predict many things, including job performances. Now, it's not the best predictor because we know that the best predictor is to see someone actually does the job. Am I correct? Well, it's at least a, it's a tie. I, I would call it a tie. I don't quibble over small differences like that. But uh, yeah, watching somebody do the job is probably the best thing. IQ is going to be very close to a tie with that. But much, much better than palm reading or, 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 or just a handwriting analysis, yeah. much better. Looking at somebody's resume, looking at how many years of education the person has, um, these things are all worse than an IQ test. So an IQ test isn't perfect, um, but the problem is nothing is. Um, hiring people is hard. Finding good workers is hard. Um, you just, there's a lot of randomness to this process, um, but an IQ test, it's really hard to beat that. And it's much better than most things we put weight on. And it's much better than emotional intelligence test because you said yourself yeah. that EQ test is like a poor IQ test. Yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing that EQ gets so much attention when it gets used in statistical horse races all the time. To, in, you know, EQ versus IQ is a predictor of job performance or other life outcomes. And um, IQ just beats it hands down every time. Um, there may be a little bit of extra value added to an IQ test, I mean, to an EQ test. But um, at the very least, if you work in a business where um, it's politically incorrect to give people an IQ test, you can at least give them an EQ test and take advantage of the fact that it's a mediocre IQ test. This is amazing. This is amazing. I, I think this, you know, the most amazing uh, uh, findings about intelligence is like you said at the beginning, this is a single domain. This is like the G. While in EQ, like in uh, personality traits, we have five different orthogonal domains. Intelligence means one thing, and this is a very hard concept to grasp in our very liberal society. Yes, I mean, there is some, I should point out, in personality, there is some positive correlation across different personality traits. If you look at, say, the five factor, personality model and it basically comes down to niceness as as the positive version of the overall personality trait but uh iq is closer to one thing than personality is okay now i would say that about job job performance i would say that iq might predict 
job performance only in the high tech, only in the high end, only in the very sophisticated jobs. But you said, no, I could predict like job performance in almost any job. How come? Well, I mean, it's a, it's hard to know exactly why, but it, I think it's a key part of it is that jobs, like normal jobs involve making a lot of little judgment calls. If it were that easy to systematize a job, um, it would already be done by a computer or a robot. If it requires little judgment calls, like figuring out how to make change or how to, um, you know, address someone's request to how to make the sandwich different at a restaurant, all these little tiny judgment calls are a big part of um, what make us valuable to firms. When a firm decides to hire a worker, they're, ha they're hiring the person to do something that a computer couldn't do, that a robot couldn't do. Um, and so ju those little judgment calls are, they draw on the general factor of intelligence. And so, yes, it's probably the case that IQ matters more in extremely high-skilled jobs than in the average low-skilled job. But um, those small judgment calls that are made on a regular basis about how to do the job right and how to get along well with others, um, these are part of what firms are paying for, and that's why IQ seems to show up in job performance across the range of both higher and lower skilled jobs. Now, this is very important. I got this from Jordan Peterson. He said that it's very, it, it's much more complicated to be a clerk at McDonald's than what you think. Because if it was that simple, we would replace it with a robot. And therefore, it's, it, it's a very sad fact that there are no jobs for people with IQ, with IQ of 85 and less, 83 and less. And this is like 10% of, of the population that we have nothing to offer them. This is something I actually don't know about, so I can't uh, I can't claim that your that your statement right there is correct or not. Um, but uh, the labor market does want to find a way to use every worker it can. Um, capitalists do make money off of you know what what a Marxist would call exploiting workers and um, trying to find the skills that somebody has, whether it's lifting or moving or being nice to customers. Um, Firms want to find a way to use every worker they can. Um, the unemployment rate does rise as cognitive skills fall in the population. But the market, the mar the amazing thing is, is that the market doesn't reward IQ as much as most people think, uh, or at least as much as the big fans of IQ think. Um, so the difference between average wages between somebody who's at say the 90th percentile of IQ and somebody who's at the average IQ, so it's 50th percentile, that gap in wages is going to be something like maybe 45%. So 30 to 60%, depending on who's looking at the numbers. So the difference wow. between being average and being in the top 10%, not as big as most people think. And this is why a lot of people who are big fans of intelligence research don't really like my book very much, because they say that uh, it's in the subtitle right there. Your nation's IQ matters so much more than your own. Your individual return to IQ just isn't all that big. The market, if, if IQ, were, this is the puzzle, this is the paradox of IQ, which kicks off chapter one of my book. If IQ is so great, why doesn't the market pay more for it? This is one thing in your book that I read over and over and over again, and I, I simply couldn't understand because I think I consider myself like a big fan of IQ research. And then, and yeah. then I came across the research that you show in your book and say, mm, how come? Because we, we, we tend to think, you know, that high IQ people can reason much better and can, you know, be much more productive in the workforce. But it's very mysterious, the research that you show. I mean, to me, what it is, it's a message, it's a message that um, basically laissez-faire capitalists wouldn't, uh, would, would not be surprised by, which is that the market tries to find ways to make lower skilled workers extremely productive. And so once you realize that a higher skilled worker has figured out some solution to a puzzle, immediately the firm owner is going to try to find a way to adapt that knowledge so that the average worker can use that knowledge. So uh -huh. smart person comes up with an invention, average worker at the firm starts using it two, three, four months later. Right. Uh -huh. And so something like that is probably at work where every time a sharp person comes up with something, um, the firm owner says, how can I tinker with this just a little bit so that my average worker or even my below average worker can take advantage of that? Oh. Maybe, it's a, maybe it's a better way to, um, you know, to, 
apply paint on an automobile. Maybe it's the better way to greet customers early in the morning when people are a little grumpy. Whatever it is, invented somewhere, adapted for the average person. So oh. capitalists are trying hard to make lower skilled workers more productive. I, mean, okay. I think we should forget that. Wow. Okay. Now it makes much more sense. So thank you so much for yeah. clarifying this point. Now we are going to your nation's IQ. And we know another pleasant, unpleasant truth about intelligence that IQ is not evenly distrib- dis- distributed among people. We know people, we, we know ethnic groups that score much higher than other ethnic groups. So on my average. question, on, on average, everything is on average. So my question to you is, when you say nation, you basically mean ethnic group or you mean something profoundly different? No, I, I really am looking at country level data. So like in the la- back of my book, what I do here is I, I in the data appendix, I take um, these estimates of national IQ and I compare them against national estimates of cognitive skills just based on normal test scores. These cross country math, science, literacy tests you hear about. And what you see is that countries that do well in the, in these, um, IQ, on these IQ tests tend to also do well on the routine test scores that you hear about in the news. So the correlation for those of you who are interested is usually 0.8 or 0.9. So that's a very, very strong relationship. So it, what I repeatedly tell people when I talk about this is that if they're, if they're not crazy about the idea of IQ or intelligence- They can intelligence, replace the word IQ with math and science tests. Exactly, and it works huh? just fine. You can I can read the rest prepare, of my book. I can't prepare, Garrett, I can't prepare. Thanks very much, yes. So, you know, um, it turns out it took a couple of years, but eventually just, I think maybe it was last year, the World Bank actually um, took the research of a lot of different folks and created what they called harmonized test scores. And you can download, anybody listening can download this in a minute. So the World Bank's harmonized test scores are part of their human capital index. And I checked the, I checked a couple months ago, they correlate 0.8 with these national average IQ scores. Very strong relationship. So countries that do well on these IQ tests, like the Ravens, tend to do well on the harmonized test score index of the World Bank. Very mainstream evidence backing up my position. But I, I, I'm sorry, but I think that you still didn't answer my questions. I know, uh. or I, I, I believe that in international math and science are basically IQ. But my question is, when you say like in China, where mm-hmm. the average IQ is, is, is much higher, would you say this is because that people in China are uh, Asian, which tends to score higher, and in Denmark, and people in, let's say, um, in the Middle East tend to score lower. So is there any, anything that differentiate between what we know of ethnic groups and what we know about nations? Because nation is, is like, is, something that encapsulates many ethnic groups, no? Or just mm-hmm. one, one ethnic groups? Well, it's, this is a good question. Like, what's the right way to look at the data, right? Um, and so in the US, it's very common to break down test scores. Our Department of Education does this um, by the ethnic groups that are widely discussed in the US today, right? So usually they break it down into some mixture of white, Hispanic, and black. And um, sometimes and now there's Asian and Asian, but these categories, as you know, like to some extent they are arbitrary. The, the one that's easiest to talk about um, because in the US it's, well, the one that's easiest to talk about for the US right now is, um, is Asian because it blends East Asia with Southeast Asia. And we know with test scores, those, and with economic outcomes, there are very large gaps between East Asian and Southeast Asian in average test score performance, average academic performance. And yet, we just lump it all together. So any of these ethnic divisions will have some degree of arbitrariness, but they can still tell us something about an average. So I focus my book completely on, um, on nations, um, with, the, with the small exception of, of breaking things down in a little more detail in one of my chapters early on. And the reason why is because I'm interested in why some nations perform better than others. So I'm interested in institutions, in governments, in savings rates, 
in these statistics and these values that are measured at the national level. So I don't, I think it's important for people to uh, break down um, differences in test scores and educational outcomes by ethnic group as they're reported in their country. My focus is on nations. Okay, so let's, let's break down what high IQ people can give to the nation. And let's start with those two things. One, they are much more patient. And mm-hmm. two, which can be like the conclusion of the first, they tend to save more money. So why those two traits and why it's so important to the economy or to the political system of the nation? Well, so um, there's a large literature in psychology and now economics showing that people who do better on IQ tests tend to be more patient by a lot of measures. Some of it is just in lab experiments. They ask a person in the lab, um, what would you rather have, um, $10 tomorrow or $11 a year from now? And those kind of measures, along with many other kinds of similar stories, show that people who do better on IQ tests, even if you know a lot of other things about a person, their education, their income, whatever, um, people who do better on IQ tests are more patient. Patience is important because patient people save more. Thinking about the future means um, saving more and giving more thought for the morrow. And if we save more, that means there's more funding at the banks and the banks can lend that money out to businesses so that they can borrow capital and build up more productive businesses. So thinking about the future is a lot of, is a big important ingredient to building a better future. It helps build the capital stock. It helps build the skyscrapers and tractors and electrical equipment that help make us all more productive. If we're all just thinking about today and trying to spend our money at the restaurants and buy clothing and bicycles and cars, that's not thinking about the future. Thinking about the future requires sacrifice, and it looks like, on average, higher IQ people are more likely to think about the future. I think that is closely related to the cold winter theory of, the, of uh, uh, Richard Link, uh, uh, cold winter theory, that people in the cold winter uh, uh, must be more patient or must must think of the tomorrow, must think of the future. I've heard of this. I've heard of this theory indirectly before, but... Um, I, uh, I do know that Flynn himself has some difficulties with it. It's a little hard to tell. I mean, it's really hard to tell why um, different intelligence, why intelligence is associated with different traits. I do offer one theory that's from some Yale scholars in my book. And their theory is basically that uh, thinking about the future is complicated, that intelligence helps you take on complicated tasks and thinking about the future is complicated. To think about the future, you have to think about four things. Um, you have to think about the world if I eat my potato now, the world if I don't eat my potato now, and then how the future turns out different in each of those different states. So we're thinking about four scenarios. Um, eat the potato, don't eat the potato now. And think the about future. the future consequences of those two things. That's four things you have to keep in mind. And um, so these Yale researchers think that that's, Just the mere idea that intelligence predicts the ability to take on complex tasks is a good explanation. And I think that's a more direct explanation than a theory about why patients might have evolved in stronger in in winter climates. There's there are good reasons for patients in every environment. It's like simulate you in many different scenarios or simulate many different versions of versions of you and then kill just with your mind the unsuccessful versions of you and just keep going with the successful version of you. It's like the in your mind uh, uh, evolution. So you're thinking about like an experimental, like an experiment within your mind? Yes. Yeah, how you make decisions. So think about multiple cases, multiple scenarios. Is That's got to be something that's associated with intelligence. The ability, one of the strongest predictors of intelligence is basically the ability to keep a lot of facts in mind at once. Okay. Now, another thing that you write in your book is that there is a very strong correlation between the average IQ or the average intelligence and how clean or or how uncorrupted your political system is. Now, we know that intelligence doesn't predict goodness, but you say that being in an uncorrupted political system is like the better choice. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, um, 
corruption does seem to be a real barrier to national prosperity. Um, and it's a case Please where- say it again so, out loud. Corruption is a, <laughs> corruption again, is again, a barrier please. to economic prosperity. Please yeah. say it again out loud and slowly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, so reduced corruption is a very important, and it is a case where individual interest conflicts with the group interest. You know, uh, free market economists who like markets like to point out Adam Smith's point that sometimes self-interest can lead to great social outcomes. Corruption is a case where self-interest typically leads to very bad social outcomes. And um, so it does appear that nation that even when you can, I, I co-authored a paper with um, a very smart uh, Nicholas Petrovsky on this, and uh, he did also work on his own pointing to this, that even if you know a lot of other things about a nation, knowing the average test scores of a country is a very good predictor of corruption. And one key reason is probably this patience channel, that basically you want pol politicians and political systems, political parties that are thinking, yeah, this would be great for us right now, taking, you know, making this company pay us some bribes or making this defense contractor pay us some bribes whatever it is. But if we could just hold this together and focus on the long run, we'll actually be richer 10 or 20 years from now. And that's way better than taking a million dollar bribe right now. So I think this is crucially important. L like being corrupted is not the optimal way to, to lead your life, even there are no values at all. Because it's like truth is the best policy going the straight way is like the best policy for you and for your nations. Now, when I speak about this thesis, people usually ask me, what about Russia? What about uh -huh. Russia? What about Russia? Because Russia are very smart people. They, they are, they are yeah, smart yeah, yeah. people, but they, their entire system, and I think China as well, I think China political system is very corrupted. And Russia again, so yes, how come yeah. this... Well, part of it is that IQ isn't everything, right? Like I say in, my, uh, in the introduction, I say, uh, my job isn't to explain everything with IQ, just half of everything. So there are a lot of other things going on in the world. And um, I, don't know if, I don't know if Russia's, the fact that Russia has been stuck with corruption in their system for decades, is that due to some kind of cultural heritage that could be changed? Is that, is that just something that's due to a, certain number of small bad people who are in power and if they change things would change i don't know the beauty of being an economist is that you get to just explain one thing at a time and <laughs> if you've done something that explains a whole lot of the data you can leave other things for other people to explain so oh, I, think okay. that, I mean notice this is the way medicine made a lot of uh, progress right medicine made progress by saying uh, instead of trying to solve all of human health just saying okay we're going to fight this disease right now that we have data on and um, biting off more than you can chew is a, a path to choking. And so economists, I think, have made a lot of progress by just biting off one piece at a time. Okay, thank you. So second question from Hivemind. Why high IQ people tend to be more cooperative? And why being cooperative is so important to the 21st uh, uh, century? Well, I think um, this is actually, in a way, I think my favorite part of this research has been finding out that, in fact, smarter groups really are more cooperative. Um, because I, I think a, a whole lot of, there, you know, like I said, there's this optimistic economist story where self-interest leads to the common interest. But we know that a whole lot of life are what economists call prisoner's dilemmas, where um, I want to get what I can while the getting is good. And if you and I both pursue our self-interest, things turn out bad. Um, so it turns out that in experiments that I have helped run and experiments that others have helped run, it turns out that when people play these cooperation games repeatedly, where there's a short run incentive to be selfish, but a long run incentive to cooperate with the other person, it turns out that when these experiments have been run by a few different folks, it turns out that smarter pairs of players, higher IQ pairs of players really are more cooperative in these long run games. So when a game is just played once, it looks like smarter people are meaner. They are more selfish. But when the game becomes, it goes from being one time to being repeated over a long period of time, uh, high IQ players seem to, pairs of players seem to cooperate more. And it's about the pair. It's about the group. 
It's not about the individual. Oh, this is the mutual impact on others. So many yes. people with high IQ have some kind of responsibility for others. Well, uh, but, it, but it can't just be that because it only shows up when the high IQ person is with another high IQ person. So it's not that high IQ people are nicer as individuals. It's that high IQ pairs of people know that they have an incentive. They're pro it seems like they're monitoring each other in an effective way. So the smarter, smarter pairs of players know, wow, I better watch myself because if I try ripping this other person off, this person's going to come back at me. And so they basically have something like, um, it's a little bit like the way the U.S. and the Soviet Union avoided nuclear war. Mm. It was mutually during assured destruction. During the Cold War, yes. Yeah, during the Cold War. It's no, the cause knew, is like, you, I, I won't do anything because if I do, you will do again. So, so we need to be uh, uh, very, very patient. We need not to be, not, not harsh to attack, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I think, so this fits in with the, with the finding that um, higher IQ people have a better theory of mind. They're better at understanding the minds of others, um, which shows up in some experiments, um, so formally and informally. Uh, so it turns out that, you know, there's this classic game called uh, that Keynes's beauty contest. And it goes like this. Um, I'm going to pick a random number between one and between zero and a hundred. Okay. And then I'm, and then I'm going to ask a whole bunch of people in the room to, to tell me a number that is one half of the room's average guess. Again, so I ask 30 people in the room. I tell them, I just picked a random number between zero and a hundred. And um, I want you to write down a number on a piece of paper. And if the number is closest to one half of the room's average number that's written down on the piece of paper, you win a prize. Wow. Okay. So, so you would, it's not 25 because the room average. No, it's not 25. It's much lower. Well, it depends. It turns out it depends a lot on how smart the people in the room are. So um, economic theory would tell you, just a little bit of thinking would tell you, well, if everybody in the room was perfectly rational, then everybody in the room would be thinking, what number between zero and 100 is exactly one half of itself? And there's only one number that fits that description, which is zero. So if everyone in the room was perfectly rational, everybody would write down zero and they'd all share the prize. But we know that not everybody's that rational. Some people are lazy, some people just aren't thinking very much. And so usually in a setting like this, what'll happen is that the real, the winning, the average number written down will be something like, I'm just guessing here based on other related research. People will write down a number like 30 on average. And so the winner will be the person who writes down 15. 15. Yeah, something like that in that ballpark, right? So the average person's writing down 30 and the average winner is putting down 15. It turns out that the high IQ person is very likely to be very close to that 15 number. They're not the 30 person, they're the 15 person. The and again, people... this is the theory of mind. The theory of you know what other, other people are thinking. Exactly. So being able to cooperate with others depends in part on being able to know what other people are like. And that means having theory of mind. Okay. Now, could you please tell me uh, when we go and we move up from those nice and very interesting games to the level of the nation. How yeah. being cooperative is, is so important to the, to the nation itself. Um, so this, this must show up in dozens and dozens of ways, right? But I, I, tend to th I tend to focus on the political angle in my book. And when I think about it, I think in terms of, for instance, um, political parties cooperating with each other. Um, you, you get along with the party that's with the opposition party right now because you're thinking, well, Today I'm, today I'm in the majority, but I don't want to rip them off too much because two or three years from now I might be in the minority and I don't want to get ripped off. So let's build norms of win-win thinking. So in the US Congress, this is known as the norm of universalism, which is you kind of share all the goodies a little bit with everybody, even the other party. Um, that's broken down recently. Um, <laughs> so, but, but the idea of um, the idea of people of political parties getting along with each other, of different branches of government getting along with each other, of businesses and government 
thinking, let's grow this pie instead of fighting over the size our slices. I think this is a big part of why some nations are more prosperous than others. And the solutions will be different in every case, right? So some people, some people who think about intelligence in human society, they think about what's called Machiavellian intelligence. They think that smarter people will tend to be sneakier and tend to rip each other off. But I focus on, my research points me in another direction, which is that um, it points me toward the work of Nobel Prize winner um, Ronald Coase, who, who passed away a few years ago. And he noted that, you know, basically people should, if it's easy for people to bargain, people should always be able to come to a win-win solution and then just argue over the slices afterwards, right? Let's make the pie as big as we can and then bicker about the slices. And good politics is about making the pie as big as you can and then haggling over the slices, which might turn out not to, the slicing might not turn out to be fair, but it's better to have a big pie and fight over the slices than have a small pie that's divided up fairly. And it turns out that experimental research and I think cross-country relationships both point in the direction that smarter groups are more cosian. They have cosian intelligence. They're more likely to think win-win. This is so anti-social agenda that now rules the European Union that it, it's targeting. I, I, so I so much agree with you, with, with, with what you just said. Now, another thing in your book that just blew my mind is how important it is for you to be around smart people. What, like, if you get the high IQ uh, nations, just being in or live in a high IQ nation, in a high IQ country, just lift me as in, in individual up? Oh, this is a great question. So, I mean, we, you know, we know from normal economics research that both low skilled and high skilled immigrants want to go to the most productive countries, to the richest countries. You know, the very, the very most naive worldview would tell you, well, if I'm really skilled, you know, if I'm like a great surgeon, I should go to a country where there's almost no surgeons and they'll really need me. But it turns out that's not the way the world works. It turns out that great surgeons want to go to countries usually where there are already a lot of great surgeons. And this shows up for all kinds of skills. And so in a way, what I'm doing is extending this idea to intelligence and reminding people that there's this well-identified psychological metric that captures this same trait that like, People want to go to places where there's the most productivity, and the most productivity tends to exist in the places that have the highest test scores. So we tend to want to be in places, whether you're low skilled or high skilled, whether you're doing well in an IQ test or poorly, you still want to be in countries where the test scores are high, places like Singapore, places like Japan, places like Denmark. I think that, in, I think that you mentioned like a study about clerks in the supermarket when you have oh, like yeah. very, very... a productive clerk, it, it, it just inflates the productivity of everyone. How come? And could you please say a few words uh, on this uh, research? Yes, yeah, so this is toward the end of the book. I talk about peer effects. At I read workplace. everything, Garrett. I read everything. This is great. Most people barely read to like the first, second chapter. So thank you very much. Um, so yes, um, Peer effects are sort of an underlying theme of the book, the idea that we're shaped by those around us. If you have neighbors who are more frugal, that probably makes you more frugal yourself. Um, but we have, there's good experimental evidence on this in, in workplaces. And, and you mentioned one of my favorite studies on this, um, which is about supermarket checkers. And um, people, um, when, when an especially, you know, when workers, workers are allocated across different shifts at a grocery store kind of randomly, right? And so you can, so, uh, statisticians can keep track of when the best workers are on different shifts. And it turns out that when there's a great worker on your shift, then the other people who aren't so hot step up their game a little bit. They're a little better. And when there are lazier workers on a shift or people who just aren't as good, that kind of brings everybody else down a little bit. And if one person can be an example to 10 other checkers, then the value of that one really good worker can be really high. Because if, you know, if, if, all, if six, seven, eight other checkers are watching this one person do a great job, even if you're only boosting that each person two or three percent, two or three percent times seven or eight checkout lines, but, that's a huge but, boost. But wait, who is watching who? It's like the, 
who is watching who? How yes. come the average uh, checkers, checkers? This is the right yes. word of check. Checkers? checkers good enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Checkers, yeah. okay. Uh, I mean, Israeli, I'm sorry. So how come the, the, the average checkers uh, become better? Does he looks at the best checkers or the best checkers looks at him and he feels uncomf uncomfortable? I knew you were going to ask me this. And I have, <laughs> I know I had to look this up when I was writing the book two or three times and make sure the jargon was right. So I'm going to have to have you correct me because I haven't looked at it in a couple of years. Because I, I had to, really did have to read the paper carefully and make sure I was not misreading it. So if memory serves now, it's that watching the good person made you better. Yes. Watching the best person made you better. Not being watched. Because so watching a, watching a good example mattered more. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. This yes. is exactly what you wrote. And I think that this is like the essence of, 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 of high IQ, high IQ nation that leverage everyone up because you just watch other very smart people and then you take yourself and lift yourself to their level because there is an, in ancient Hebrew, we say you, uh, you should be a tail for the lions and not the head for the dogs, okay? Ah, you, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a very good line. I like that, yeah. Yes, but, but, yeah. In, but in, the same, in, in the same time area, there was a different idiom in Rome said ah. you should be the first in your village and not the last one in Rome. So ah. I think that this is exactly uh, capturing Malcolm Gladwell idea in David and Goliath. So mm -hmm. would, would you say that high institutes, like Ivy League institutes are the best, or people who go or get accepted to Harvard, Yale, Cornell, et cetera, are, are the kind of people that makes more money? So I... Th yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of the great questions in education research. Does, does schooling make you more productive or does schooling just prove that you're more productive? Yes. Um, this, my colleague, Brian Kaplan, wrote a very good book on this called The Case Against Education where he pushes for this signaling theory, the idea that schooling is showing that you're more productive. Now, that said, I went to Cornell for a year, and um, I'd like to think that Cornell actually made me better. But um, I have to admit that the, re you know, these schools screen for smart people in the first place. They screen for conscientious people. Um, very they screen smart for creative people. thinkers. Yeah, they, they bring in great people. people. Right, so yeah. let me just uh, quote Thomas Sowell. The best thing of Harvard education is that you never uh, in your life uh, will be afraid of other people with Harvard education. <laughs> <laughs> this is Thomas. Uh, I'm a big uh, Soho fan myself, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah. now, which leads me, I think, to my last question regarding the U.S. now and Israel now and how this all relates to immigration because, mm -hmm. because, na because immigration changes the delicate fabric of society, the delicate fabric of the average IQ. Helmut Nyborg said that if the average IQ is below 90, you can't have a sustained democracy. Dem democracy. Yeah, I actually have not looked at that um, data to see whether that's true. Um, it seems just informally the correlation might be about in that ballpark. Um, but I do think that, for one thing, um, there will be innovation in the future. And so the ability of lower test scoring countries to maintain good governance is probably much better now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. So um, progress will continue to be made. Um, that said, uh, you know, I, I have two chapters in the book that really talk about immigration in two different ways. And you know, the classical economist's perspective on immigration is, shouldn't be forgotten, which is that it's related to what I was saying before, which is that the invisible hand finds a, wants to find a way to use everyone. Right, so low-skilled workers. The normal, the normal estimate of from economic theory is that if a bunch of folks who don't have a lot of skills show up in your country, the market is going to find a way to make those workers very, very useful, and um, they're going to be other people will hire them. They will end up helping to build the capital stock, and then everybody in the country gets to use the capital stock they built. So that sort of very optimistic scenario is definitely part of the story. Um, the more pessimistic part of the story is, well, suppose, uh, how, are those, how are those folks going to vote? Um, and, you know, the middle chapters of my book do point out that 
um, less that voters with lower levels of education, voters with lower test scores are less likely to support market friendly policies. So this is the tension. Mainstream simple economics, economics that I really believe in, says that low skilled immigrants are a boon to us. They're a boon to everyone. Um, at the very least, they're not hurting folks um, in the long run. And the second point is how will they change the institutions of the country? How will they change the government? That second part is more speculative. And so I play up that speculation in the book. I have to point out that we don't know really. We haven't run a lot of experiments like this with where we have big waves of low skilled immigration coming to a country and watching what happens to government over the next 40 or 50 years. So I think the jury has to still be out on the net effects of low skilled immigration on institutions. But the theoretical argument is this balance. Economics, low skill immigration, great news. Um, politics, we'll find out. Wow, listen, this was one hell of a conversation. Thank you so much. I would, I would like to ask you about your second book, but I didn't uh, read, it, read it yet. So I will uh, have you, <laughs> I will have you uh, again on the show with your permission after I finish reading your second book, okay? I'd be glad to. It was reviewed in The Economist. Um, it was great fun um, watching it get attention, especially in Europe. Okay, thank you so much. Now, before we end our conversation, let me ask you two questions that I always ask my uh, colleagues, my interview interviewees, I think. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, one, give me a book that you read in the last five years that just blew your mind. Oh, wow. I've been loving Citizens by Simon Shama, his book about the French Revolution. It is a cultural history of the French Revolution. It's It's about a thousand pages long and I have not finished it, but each 200 pages is its own book. Watching a society go from moderate reforms, moderate political reforms to eating itself alive and killing many of its best people was very sad. Um, and it's, it's something, it, it's a cautionary tale for every rich country, I think. Um, Citizens by Simon Shama, love it. This is great, and we will link this book in the description. And this is funny because, you know, the French Revolution th thought that they are just following reason and intelligence and IQ. Uh -huh. And yes, from exactly. this uh, belief, they just slaughtered many, many, many people. So intelligence might be with, without the right uh, values, without the right tradition, can make a lot of harm. So this is number one. And number two, Uh, give me your best or your number one productivity tip, because in this channel, we also speak about productivity, how to be more productive. Now, you already wrote two books and you are a professor and you have many very interesting and important articles and papers regarding intelligence and economics. So give me your productivity tip. My most important productivity tip that really applies to me personally is I use software to uh, lock myself out of the Internet a few hours a day. Oh, uh, it's so great much. fun. It's great fun to go on social media and talk with very smart people, people a lot smarter than me, um, and to watch their cool quips, their cool quotes. But um, I use something called cold turkey on my laptop, and I use something called stay focused on my smartphone. Both oh, very stay focused is great, and we will link yeah. those two. There is a book by Carl Nipot said, uh, Uh, digital minimalism that says exactly the same thing. Just cut, cut your social media by half and you will be much more productive. So Professor Garrett Jones, thank you so much for- Thank you uh, so very much. This is a very good conversation. Show. Enjoyed going back and forth with you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.